Good morning. Good morning. Quick announcement. Uh, just a reminder that there is no lunch bunch after today's service. Uh, they're taking the summer off and reassessing. And so, uh, once again, no lunch bunch. Um, you know, I tried to take it over, but I guess people want more than cereal because that's... That, <laughs> That's all I can cook right there, cereal. Sometimes I burn it, sometimes I don't. But <clears throat> want to start this morning by asking a question. Explain this place. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I get asked a lot, and so does Pastor Allen. Tell us about this refuge. And, and we really don't know what to say. You know, and are there people that go there? Yeah, there's, there's people. You know, what kind of people? Sure, sure, they come too. Yeah, they, they all come. And the reason why it, it's so amazing is because this is really an unexplainable place. So many different things happen here that are just unexplainable. And there's a part uh, of our culture that says, uh, that's a little sketchy. We need to be able to define it. However, Pastor Allen and myself hope that this place is never defined. That we never get to a point to say, oh, this church is this. Now, there's a lot of people out there that have ideas about this church, uh, and they're not good ones. <laughs> that doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother us at all. But uh, it, it's one of those things that I would rather this place be a mystery because of what God is doing than get into a place of being business as usual. Now, follow me here. This is important because... The purity of this place must remain at all costs. The purity of it. And unfortunately, anything that, that man puts their hands on loses purity. Uh, there's a lot of things in my life that I said, Oh Lord, thank you for doing this. Let me take control and I ruin it. It's the same thing here. In fact, I want to kind of give you a reference to it by telling you this story of a musician. Back in the 90s, his name was Vinks, and nobody knows who he is. If you do, I have high respect for your musicality. Vinks was a guy that played his bongos in a bar, and he would sing. And as he was doing his show at this small place, a uh, very prominent artist, I'm not going to tell you who it is, their bus broke down, and as it was getting broke, this artist went into this bar to get a drink and witnessed this man playing his bongos and singing and became extremely envious of this man's natural, God-given talent. He was beautiful as he sang, and he was had the, the crowd just captivated. And so after the show, the, the artist went up and said, you are amazing and you need to be heard by the world. Come with me. I'm going to take you to my record label. And he went. And he made a CD. And he toured with this artist all over the place. And as they were telling his story and saying, how do you like it? You went from nothing to this amazing world tour, how do you feel? And the guy's like, I want to go back to nothing. They said, why? He said, because now I play for many and I cannot connect with them individually. Now all I'm doing is performing a show. Now I have to be at this spot during the show and I have to say these things because it's all about the show and it's no longer about me sharing my soul with others. And it was the last album he recorded as far as I know. And what's so amazing about this is we do that, don't we? Something that is so pure that maybe God gives us, we try to exploit it and make it bigger. God heals somebody and we say, Lord, thank you for doing that. Now come over here and heal this person and then I'll take credit for it. In fact, anything that we do by human efforts is not pure. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Usually when you do something pure, it's because you're being led by the Spirit. When you help an old lady across the street, it's because maybe you have compassion. However, if you go to that old lady and say, Hey, everybody, look what I'm doing. I'm helping this old lady. Get up right now. I'm helping this old lady across the street. 
maybe I shouldn't have said it like that, sorry. <laughs> but because this place is pure, we, we have this phrase, and this is usually how I try to explain refuge. I say, it can't be explained, it must be experienced, yes, and that sounds so deep, and I say that, and people go, ooh, and I'm like, yeah, it's magic. But here's the point. The calling of refuge has never changed. And as long as I'm breathing and Pastor Allen is breathing, it never will change. And that's what we're going to go over today. Because it's up to all of us to maintain the purity as God continues to do his thing. As God continues to bless and reinstate and grow and everything else, it's real easy to begin to go, hey, Guess who we are when we should never say that as more as we should say, guess who he is? Because that's where the purity comes from. Today we're going to look at many scriptures with small stories about breaking down basically what we are and what we do in three simple areas. First thing we do is we accept the broken and the hurting. We accept them. If you're new here and you think you're going to be judged... <laughs> We can't judge you because we really don't want you to see what we've done either. Right? Uh, I don't know if this is a compliment or not, but I've heard people that come right out of jail say, this place is so inviting and loving and I fit right in. Somebody's even come up to me and they say, Pastor, I love your sermons. And I'm like, you're welcome. And they say, because you make it so simple, a little kid could understand it. <laughs> so you're saying I, I dumb it down? Yes, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for not being smart, Pastor Travis. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> when I say we accept the broken and the hurting... I know many people claim that, but, but I want to share this with you. I don't care who comes through these doors. We're going to love them. We're going to accept them. Uh, yeah, even your enemies. Yeah, that person that you're thinking about right now, yes, everyone else, but that one. <laughs> even that one. And I'll give you an example. In my ministry, I had someone who was my antagonist. My uh, critic continued to beat me up in my ministry to the point it was relentless and I even thought about quitting and the Lord said, you do not work for anybody else, you work for me and you will love well at all cost for me, not anybody else. Well, needless to say, I would finally, they had gotten rid of me and the refuge has started and as the refuge was going, it was about four or five years after that. And the refuge is kind of doing its own thing, and it's great. And this enemy walks in the doors. And I'm like, Lord, I will tell them to leave in your name. <laughs> and the Lord says, oh, no, you will love them. And I said, no, if they try to pull this stuff, I'm going to get my boys and you're going to see them today. And this is when the Lord started doing business with me. He said, who do you think you are? This refuge is not your place. It is mine and you will love well. I wish I could tell you at this point, I said, yes, Lord. And the angels flew in. <laughs> and the unicorn on a rainbow came by. And I went and embraced this individual. No, I went up. Good morning. How are you? Where did you park? I better not do that. I'm just being real. Can I be real here? Yeah, absolutely. And so eventually what took place is uh, I was basically uh, disciplined by God and put in my place 
that at all costs, I will love well no matter who the individual is. So if you're here this morning and you think everybody's looking at you, don't worry about it. We're just glad you're here. We want you to see what Jesus has done in our lives, and we trust that he's going to do the same in yours. So once again, we accept the broken and the hurting at all costs. I want to read some scripture that helps reiterate this. This is out of Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. It says, when Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Then Jesus told him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. He said, Lord, if you are willing. Now really put yourself in this situation. Some of you can maybe relate to the leper. Because the leper back then was the outcasts of all outcasts. This leper was contagious. When a leper would walk down the street, many people would say, unclean, unclean as a warning. Watch out, here comes the leper. And everybody avoided the leper. And here comes Jesus. Now I really want you to see this picture. There Jesus is, many people around him. Here comes this leper towards Jesus. What do you think everybody did? They bolted. Run! Jesus, watch out, it's a leper! And Jesus just stands there. And this leper comes up to Jesus, head down, embarrassed. And he says, if you're willing, I know you can cleanse me. And then Jesus does something that is unheard of. He touches the leper. This man has not been touched in years, had not had any human contact. And Jesus said, I am willing. Be clean. Boom. Leprosy gone. He is willing. And see, that's just it. We have no right to think that God is not for someone, but that he is for everyone. And in that, we don't need to be afraid of everybody else that's out there. In my culture where I grew up, it was, you have to avoid people. You're going to turn into them. Now, I will put a disclaimer. Don't go hanging around places God told you not to hang out around. You know what I'm saying? Can I get an amen on that? Yeah, you don't get to say, for you, Jesus, I'm going back. No. God said, I gave you a brain. Let's use this. But at no time are we ever able to say, look at that person. When we should be saying, Lord, I know you're willing. Use me. Next story, Mark chapter 2, verses 13 through 17 says this. I love this one. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth, the IRS booth. (laughs) Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners and those people? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. What an awesome story. Now, let me explain to you the tax collector and how hated a tax collector was. The Roman Empire was very smart. They oversaw the Israelites, but they didn't tax them themselves. What they did is they went and got one of the own Israelites and said, here, we're going to make you rich, and you're going to be the one that collects the taxes from your own kind. So imagine how much you would not like this person. Coming up to you with more money than you have, saying, hey, you need to give me money. So I can imagine as Jesus is walking, and there he is at the tax collector booth, which I think is hilarious. 
many people are waiting as Jesus is walking, going, hey, Jesus, watch out. There's that tax collector, Levi. And Jesus goes up to Levi and says, what's up, man? Levi's like, uh, nothing. What's up with you? And Jesus says, follow me. And Levi goes, oh, okay, cool. And then Jesus does what I think is the coolest thing ever. Jesus says, guess what, Levi? Levi's like, what, what Jesus? <laughs> We're going to your house to eat tonight. Because I know you got money. <laughs> I know you got the best steaks. We're eating at your house on your dime. <laughs> and Levi's like, cool. So he calls all his friends. Hey, other tax collectors that everybody hates, come to my house. All you sinners and cheaters and haters and all these different people, come to my house. Jesus is hanging out with us. And they're like, really? So they show up and there Jesus is with his disciples loving on the sinners and the religious community cannot stand it. We can never be this. We can never be a people that does not desire the healing of another. And unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, we live in a culture where a lot of you would even testify that the Christian community is more of a community of judgment and not a community of love. It is imperative <clears throat> for the purity of this place that we never become judgmental. Can I get an amen? amen? So notice this. After we love the broken and the hurting, then the most amazing thing happens. This is when the broken become righteous. Think about it. <clears throat> Let me say it again. The broken become righteous. How many of you in this room, when they, somebody explained who you were, used the word righteous? <laughs> me either. In fact, it's sad because a lot of times our Christian culture uses this righteous word as a word of punishment and overseeing. When let me give you what I believe the true definition of righteousness is. Are you ready? It's not how many books you read. A lot of you said amen. amen. It's not how much you attend. It's not what church you go to. It's not how much Christian music you listen to. It's not how much Christian gear you wear. It's not how much you give. You know how hard that is for me to say? <laughs> it is when you say, it's no longer about me, Jesus. It's about you. No longer me. It's about you. Pastor Allen and myself and Red were talking about this in the office, and Allen came up with a good picture that I want to share with you. It's when you no longer stand tall on your own, but it's when you stand behind Jesus and let Jesus represent who you are. That you are no longer the leader of your life, but you have surrendered and you allow Christ to be your life. Ladies and gentlemen, that is when you become righteous. I don't care what anybody in this world says. Now notice this. Romans chapter 3 verses 21 through 24. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. The righteousness is given is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. I want to stop right there. Because there's many of you in this room right now going, I'll never be righteous. That's just not me. And I'm here to tell you, it's exactly you. Because it is a given thing for anyone who believes in Christ Jesus. Now, there's a difference. I'm not going to say that agrees with Christ Jesus. There's a difference. Can I get an amen? There's many people that agree with Christ Jesus, but they don't give Jesus their life. We need to be a people that say, it's not about me, God. It's about you. And yes, even you will be the righteousness of God. Luke chapter 18 says this. This is a parable. This is a very powerful parable. Hear it well. It says, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. 
Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. We already found out how much people hated tax collectors. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. I'm not like robbers or evildoers or adulterers or even like this tax collector here. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he would beat his chest and said, God, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. I tell you, Jesus said, that this man, rather than the Pharisee, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. The reason why I say this is because there are many, many people in this room that God has done great and wonderful things in your life. Can I get an amen? Amen. Don't get self-righteous. Do not get self-righteous. Don't ever get to a point where you go, look at what I have done. And let me tell you, the reason why I'm so adamant about this is because I used to be the chief of self-righteous people. I went to the church in Lubbock. I served in the church. I was told to stay away from those people. I condemned people by my mouth in the name of God. And it took until I was 21 years old before God slaps me on the head and says, Stop! You are not about my business. And he tore Every self-righteousness bit out of me. It was a very difficult six months in my life. To the point, at the end of that six months, I looked at God and I said, I am done with you. I've had it. I'm tired of listening to man. I'm tired of being let down by others. If you're real, you have to show yourself to me. And God went, you got it. (laughs) And I'm here to tell you, changed my life he was not the god i was taught he was not a god of division he is a god of love and restoration and i began to love on people the way that he loved on me and that is when i found freedom in christ and you should have seen me go back to where i once came from I wish I could tell you as I came back and I said, I've met the real Jesus. Everybody went, oh, that is so awesome. Congratulations. No, I was told I'm influenced by demons. I'm weak in my faith. I've lost my way. And I went on my own. I said, so be it. Because I'm going to follow a real God. I'm not going to follow God of man. Here's what's so funny. I finally get into ministry. And it was horrible. (laughs) And I'm not going to say the ministry was horrible. It's just me trying to perform in the ministry was difficult. And then something happens and and the Lord says, here, I want to create this thing called refuge. And I'm like, yeah, now you're talking, God. This is going to be awesome. This is going to be all the best people of Lubbock, Texas. All the rich and they're all going to love me. And I'm going to be paraded throughout the city of Lubbock as this amazing pastor. And God went, yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's not what I had in mind. But uh, let's, uh, let's see what happens. And you're what happened. Absolutely. Let me say this. Pastor Allen and myself, man, we sit here and we talk to each other. We have coffee together. And we talk about what an honor it is to be involved on something that God is doing. You see, when I say the broken become righteous, understand that is all that Jesus does. I cannot explain it. I cannot tell you how the Lord has changed individuals in this place. I wish I could tell you, of course I know how it happened. It's because I was involved in it. (laughs) Doesn't happen that way. In fact, there is no uh, common way that Jesus moves. He does His thing in His timing, and our job is to love others while He does it. There is no discipleship class. There's no membership class. Here's what there is. 
I believe that Jesus is going to change your life, and I get to have a front row seat while he does it. Absolutely. Oh, and I love this one. This is my favorite, and if I'm talking about you, keep your hand down. The bad boys and the bad girls that come in here with their arms crossed, they don't want to be here. Somebody talk them into it. And they're here going, I hate Christians, I hate God, I can't stand it, I don't even want to be here. You are the ones he gets first. Yeah. I love it when people come in here tough. Because for some reason, a song or something I say or somebody hugs them and they break, they start crying. <laughs> He's real! I'm like, yeah, there you go, tough. Toughy, tough, tough right there. But I don't know how he does it. It's something that only Jesus can do. Man cannot do this, and that is what the purity is. So my, my point is this. If you're here this morning and you don't feel righteous, I'm here to tell you, man, just know that you're loved. Just know that. And know that, man, we care about you and we want you to care about us and we're going to love each other while Jesus does his thing. Well, pastor, how does he do it? I have no idea, but it is crazy. And many of you in this room are going, you know what, I tried this Jesus thing out. It just doesn't work. Well, give me advice. What do you want me to do? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to say the same things I did when I was 21. God, show me who you are and mean it in your heart. And get ready. <laughs> he will do his thing. That's the purity of this place. Now notice this. Galatians chapter 2. This is probably the best scripture that can help us embody what it looks like when the righteous or the broken become righteous. Galatians 2, 19 and 20 says, For through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Christ lives in me the life I now live in this body I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me ladies and gentlemen that is righteousness it's no longer I who live it ain't about me it's about him it's about Jesus now let's move forward once we know that the broken become righteous, we should think at this point, once we become righteous, we should walk around with our chest out and declare, look how righteous God has made me. Not here. When the Lord begins to heal your life and he begins to reinstate you and it's no longer about you, then here's our job. We need to go ahead, get out here, and go look for more broken people. We want somebody to experience what we've experienced. And that's what we do. We go to people and we don't say, you know you're going to hell, don't you? <laughs> no, we go to people and we say, check it out, man. And they look at us and they go, you're different. And we go, I know. Isn't it crazy? And they say, how did it happen? And we say, I have no idea. But I think differently. I see differently in this Jesus guy. He's real and, he, and he's in my heart and it's all about me. And you got to come with me to church. Well, I don't want to go to church. No, you're coming because... You're going to get loved on. I mean real love. You can come just the way you are. And I'm going to take you to coffee and you're going to talk to me. And I'm going to tell you to do the same thing I did. You're going to ask Jesus to show himself to you. And I'm going to sip my coffee and I'm going to giggle. <laughs> as he changes your life. And then when you walk around where you used to go and your life has changed. People are going to be like you are weird. And you're going to say, I yeah, know. You want a hug? <laughs> Here's what happens when the righteousness look for the broken. This is a story that Jesus told, a parable to a man who was wanting to know what it looked like to do it correctly, to be a man of God. And this is a story of the Samaritan. A man was beaten and robbed, and a Levi and a priest both walked by this guy. But here's where we pick up on the parable. 
Verse 33 of Luke 10 says, But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Then Jesus said, go and do likewise. You want to know what it's like? to be about God's business, then go and do likewise. It's amazing how much church can confuse what it means to be about God's business. Oh man, churches, we can tell you, nope, 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 you got to go to this class and you're not ready until we sign off on your certificate. You got to listen to this music, you got to wear these clothes, you got to say these things, and then this is what you have to do to somebody. When the truth is, you just take Jesus with you as you go. That's all you got to do. Pastor, do I have to quit riding my Harley? Please don't. (laughs) Pastor, can I ride a moped? Please do. (laughs) I don't care what you do. In fact, there was a time in my life I had two job opportunities. I could either work at the jean store or the music store. And I was very self-righteous. And I went, God, show me thy will on where thy wants me to work. In the factory of denim. Or in the place of music. And I believe God's up there going, oh, I want to kill him now. Oh, my. And he wouldn't answer me. And I'm like, Lord, where? Where do you want me to go? I don't want to make the wrong decision. Because if I make the wrong decision, I guess you'll be mad at me and I'll be cursed. And I really felt like God goes, I don't care. (laughs) Just take me with you. Take me with you. So I chose the music store. And as I walk into the music store and I'm hired, the manager of the music store goes, can I talk to you for a minute, Travis? I said, yes, you can. (laughs) And I go in and he says, hey, I know you're a Christian. And I'm like, does it show? (laughs) And he goes, I want you to leave that Jesus junk at home. And there's a part of me that wanted to go, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And the Lord was like, Travis, shut your mouth. And I said, yes, sir. And I went home and I was wore out. I was like, God, I picked the wrong store. I'm so sorry. And God's like, did you take me with you? Yes, I did, but I can't even talk about you. He won't let me talk about you at the store. And God goes, thank me. I can't say thank God because he's talking. He's like, thank me. (laughs) So I didn't. I worked well. I worked under the Lord, not under man. And and here's what's neat about my manager. He had a tattoo, and this was before tattoos were artsy. And it was a picture of the Roswell Martian. You know what I'm talking about? The green guy, the big black eyes. And he told me, he said, I don't believe in this religious stuff. I do believe in aliens, and that's what I worship. And I was like, okay. Have you seen the mothership? Or... I don't know. So all I did is I worked. And I loved on him. And I loved on everybody who came in the store. And, and all these different things. And there's a part of me in my life. I'm going, man, I'm not doing God a good service. I should be telling people about this. I should be demanding that people change their lives. And I believe God was trying to show me something because many years later, this manager gets promoted out of Lubbock. And he comes up to me on his last day and he says, hey, I want to thank you. I was like, for what? And he said, I'm not saying I believe in God, but if there is a God, I would believe it because of how you live your life. And I went, what? Yeah. Yeah. I had no idea how awesome I was, right? 
No, here's my point in this. Even when I felt like I wasn't doing anything, that's great because Jesus was doing His thing. And He was doing it through me because all I did was bring love into the store. I loved on everybody that came in. The old people that walk early in the malls. I played Frank Sinatra for them as they went around. And, and I just loved on people. And, and for some reason, God showed Himself to my manager as I lived. That's who we need to be. That's the purity of it. That's as we go, we take Jesus with us and He does all these amazing things. It just so happens to be this happens a lot at Starbucks. <laughs> I'm telling you, get in front of somebody and have no answers for them but just love on them, see if Jesus doesn't show up. And not only change their life, change your life in the midst of it. To where you will walk away going, I had no idea. In fact, how many of you have ever obeyed God and you really didn't want to, but you did it anyway? Then after you obeyed Him, you went, I felt good. Man, your, your spirit feels good because you're obedient. And you really didn't worry about the outcome. You're just glad that you heard God and you're obedient. Ladies and gentlemen of refuge, this is what keeps us pure. Is that it's not what we do as a church. It's about what He does to us as a church. And we keep our hands off and we let them. So once again, we accept the broken and the hurting. The broken become righteous. Then the righteous go looking for more broken people. Understand this. We talk about refuge and how different it is. But know this. It is not about this place. It's not about this beautiful carpet. It's not about these pews. It's not about the building that we may build. It's not about how much we may grow. It's not about any of that stuff. In fact, let's bring the banner of refuge down because it's all about one person. Not about a place, about a person. It's about Jesus. Without Jesus, there is no refuge. Now we can ask Jesus to leave and we can say we're a church and we can say we're a refuge and we can become self-righteous because anything of God that is without Jesus that we do on our own is self-righteous. It's all about Jesus. And so I say this, Jesus, he can't be explained. He must be experienced. That's what we do. We love people while others experience who Jesus is. Can I get an amen? amen? So to close the sermon, I simply say this as we go out there. I don't know if you're a broken or hurting. Great. I don't know if you're being transformed from broken into righteousness. Great. I don't know if you're righteousness and you're looking for broken. It doesn't matter. Keep going and experience well. Amen. Let's stand together. By the way, another miracle of God, we finished on time. <laughs> Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you so much that you're a faithful God. And Lord, that you love the broken because it's the broken that you heal and make righteous. Father, I pray that your purity maintain in this place. Father, it's not about what we do for you. It's about what you do in us and through us. So, Father, I say, come, Holy Spirit, do all you have in mind with us, your refuge. Father, may it never be about this place. May it always be about Jesus. Father, be with us as we go, for we will love well. In Jesus' name we pray, everyone said. Amen. Amen. Go and love well.